This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design and development from a group of people with one thing in common. We love Drupal. This is episode 340, Storybook. Welcome to Talking Drupal. Today we're talking about Storybook with Randy Ost. Randy is the creative director at Four Kitchens and the project manager for Emulsify. Randy, welcome to the show and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Nick Laughlin, and today my co-hosts are joining us for the next four weeks as guest host is Mike Anello. Mike is a Drupal developer and trainer, and you may know him as the co-owner of Drupal Easy. Mike, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, and good to uh, talk to you all again. Also joining us, as usual, John Picozzi. Here I am. Hi, internet friends. So we've got uh, one quick update this week. Uh, so there was a security release last week for CK Editor. Uh, and I think the theme of March 2022 is third-party library updates. Uh, just yesterday, uh, Guzzle also came out with a security update. Uh, so if you just finished updating your Drupal 9 sites, you now need to update it again. So keep an eye out for that. Um, looks like it's a low-risk one. It was marked pretty low. but uh, still definitely want to uh, take care of that. Yeah, I updated my site over the weekend. Now I guess I'm going to have to do it again. <laughs> yeah, you think there's you more said. of like visibility on these dependency updates with what's going on in the Ukraine and the fact that there was, I know in the, there was a view dependency, a Vue.js dependency that um, was modified to, to do something nefarious to computers in Russia and Belarus. But you think that with all that going on, there's going to be more scrutiny on these third-party dependencies? Um, I mean, I think there's definitely some scrutiny. Yeah. I think what you're referring to is an NPM library where somebody, yeah, somebody modified it. Um, I think this is also just, it could be coincidence too, or maybe there was some dependency that, you know, that, CK editor had that force an update and they saw the same thing with Guzzle. I, yeah, I, I couldn't yeah. tell you. I don't think it's a bad thing though. I think, you know, I, I uh, think we, oh, absolutely. we, yeah, we often just, you know, run composer commands or NPM commands and we get a bunch of code. We're not really sure where it's coming from and hoping that it's okay. Yeah. I think NPM is the king of that. I, I still never get over to like, you know, a default react install has something like, 10,000 NPM modules, I feel like it's just, it's just too much, but, um, but yeah, make sure that you, you update your sites and, and, uh, sign up for the Drupal security newsletter. That's how I always get updated on these. Um, they'll send out a PSA and if there's an out of cycle one like this, uh, it'll be sure to catch your attention. So moving on to the module of the week, uh, I think for the last month and a half or so, we've had a theme of uh, Martin providing all the modules of the week, um, which which isn't normal, by the way. We do provide our own modules of the week sometimes. Um, but this one actually was also recommended to me today by Martin. Um, I have a customer that is um, seems to be under some sort of DDoS attack. Um, and so I was looking for some things to do to help, you know, strengthen the site and you know obviously adding some firewall rules for Cloudflare is one of the things but he recommended a module called perimeter uh, which is not one that I'd heard of before and uh, it's a pretty easy module to install but what perimeter does is it allows you to list certain pages like WP login and if a user gets a 404 at the pages listed they will get added to the ban table. Um, so it's basically a way to say, hey, these pages don't exist on my site. If somebody's accessing this and getting that 404, then they're most likely a bot um, or somebody malicious. Is that immediate? Like after one hit, they're banned? I will have to investigate Sounded a little like further. It. I didn't visit the page because I don't want to get myself banned. <laughs> um, but... Yeah. That's a reason why you read the module page. The module page clearly says, hey, before you install this, make sure you can remove yourself from the ban table. Yeah, I mean, I, I knew I could, but I 
I, I knew I could because I have root access. I mean, it's platform, so I have SSH access and can run Drush commands. But, um, but yeah, I believe I believe it's a single a single visit will ban you. But um, you know, thankfully, between this and Cloudflare, it looks like uh, the DDoS is clearing up, and um, we're able to resolve that. But yeah, if if you're if you're seeing a, a significant number of four fours on those pages, this might be a module to look at. Have you, did you actually uh, utilize it? Uh, the impression I got from the module page was that it um, it has like a predefined list of, of options. It didn't sound like it was configurable through the UI. So I was just curious. No, it's configurable through the UI. Um, oh, cool. So I just kept with the default ones. But what I did is I looked at the 404 report that the redirect module provides. Mm -hmm. And so there's actually two other, and I noticed for example that, um, the WP login page has been hit yeah. 10,000 times in the last, you know, two or three weeks. So um, that's definitely one of the ones. And then I did notice there were a couple of other. That's not you forgetting, it. forgetting what site you're working on. No, okay. um, but I did notice there were a couple other URLs that have even more 404. So I'm, I'm thinking about banning those as well. Got it. Cool. So moving on to our primary topic this week. So Randy, we always start with the easy question. What is storybook? Well, you know, whenever uh, whenever you have children and you want to read them fairy tales, you open the storybook <laughs> and you give them the stories. Uh, no, what mm. storybook is, storybook is um, a response to um, designers and developers using component-driven uh, methodology. So what that means is, is like if you're uh, out there creating components and you want a way to, to catalog and test and review them, uh, Storybook is a framework that allows you to do that. Uh, Storybook grew up in the like JavaScript framework world, like React is really a, a first party for them. Um, and then it grew into like Vue.js and um, HTML as well as some other different varieties. But basically Storybook is there for, um, for front end development of components. It allows you to review the user interfaces. It allows you to combine them in custom ways to make sure that everything is working the way that you want it to. And it provides methods for you to test those components. So a lot of components have state or like data that they consume. And so what it does is it allows you to actually go in and test, um, stress test those components, um, either separately, individually, or as part of collections, as part of like molecules or templates or pages. Um, and it's, it's grown super huge and robust with a bunch of different add-ons. Uh, and maybe we'll talk about some of those a little bit later. So, but generally storybook is for building, reviewing and testing components. So stepping back from storybook a little bit, right? So it's, it's you know, compo a component library tool um, focuses on component-based design systems. I'm wondering why um, component libraries and component-based design systems are so popular right now or have, mm -hmm. have become popular over the last couple of years. Yeah. So part of the reason, well, the main reason why like this component driven methodology has become so popular is the realization that websites, um, the, the original thinking of websites was really like document focused. Like there was a, an imprint of this is a document and a lot of the baggage that came along with that um, was built into the system. Like we're designing pages, you know? And so, I mean, the, the original like HTML spec, um, is really focused on a document first kind of, kind of view of things. And as the web grew throughout its history, we've, we've seen that like, you can start adding state, you can start writing to and from databases to collect up data. And then suddenly the web has more app-like interactions. So it's a little bit less about documentation and more about interactions and state and uh, having a user experience that's very much more app-like. And so now we have this continuum of like document document model in our brain, not document model like HTML. And then we have this like application and, and front end state sort of thing. And what we found is um, designing per page is really 
a wasteful process. Um, you end up getting a lot of like custom things, uh, custom components throughout the site. So say you've got like a, a summary card that is supposed to tease people to reading the full article. You could have like many, many different views of this if you take a per page kind of model for designing and building uh, because everybody wants each individual page to, to look custom and look unique. Uh, and what we found is that with re responsive design, because things had to get more flexible, that more work had to go into creating all of these different custom versions of what really were the same thing, at least under the hood, they were the same thing. And so that has led to, um, you know, building things out as components to make them reusable and to create variations of those like reusable components. So that's, that's a pretty long winded, like start to finish there, but it's, part of why we've gone to components is that it is very reusable and we're able to like Lego bricks, like make multiple things um, using the same bricks. So your last two answers make it seem like this is mainly geared towards JavaScript frameworks. Is that, am I reading that right? I'm not a front end guy, so I don't know, but yeah, so that's a. I'm glad you asked that question because I don't want to give the impression that this is like JavaScript only because that's not the case. Um, Storybook has a like it has a couple of different flavors and one of the flavors is HTML. So um, so you can actually work with components in HTML in Storybook without you know needing to like dive into React or Vue.js to be building any of the things that you need to build. So if you're a front ender who is very comfortable just writing HTML and CSS and whatever little like sprinkling of JavaScript you need, you can use Storybook and work that way and be very comfortable. That's really good to hear because I was about to feel way out of my depth. So I'm still with you. So I've heard of, um, I, you know, I've heard of Storybook in the past. I've seen a presentation or two on Pattern Lab. Are they competitors or do they do the same thing? Are they different? How would you, you know, compare contrast? Sure. So, I mean, I would kind of view them as like friend peditors, um, you know, because like they're not, they want to take up the same kind of brain space, uh, but there's an overlap in a lot of the, a lot of the concepts and a lot of the work that goes into it. So I will preface this by saying that, that it has been several years since I've used Pattern Lab. Uh, and so like, I've, like I've had conversations with Brad Frost about Pattern Lab and, and all of that. And I think the, the last time that I was really in the know on Pattern Lab was when it was starting to make the transition from being PHP based to being Node JS based. So if anything that I say isn't true of the modern uh, Pattern Lab, uh, please um, write in and complain, and I will respond to you personally. But so the comparison between the two, they really have a lot of overlap in that they are both about building components. They're both about organizing those components and making those components available to uh, be consumed by whatever um, service you're using, whether that's Drupal or WordPress or a React app or you know whatever new cool things the kids are doing on TikTok. So um, there's really a lot of overlap. I think the difference between them is in the like the mind share or the like number of people contributing and using um, each of these. So um, Pattern Lab has uh, a larger or sorry, a smaller sphere of influence than what Storybook does. Storybook has a very large and robust community. And on top of that, like they have um, a great like plugin. Uh, economy, or I'm sorry, um, I don't know. I, yeah, I'm just trying to think of it. Does it, does it, there we go. Ecosystem. Thank you. Um, yep. thanks for saving me on that. Anyway. So they've got a great ecosystem for add-ons. Um, not that I'm saying that pattern lab doesn't, but the, there's a lot more contributions happening in, in storybook that are making it easier to work with storybook and work with other things that you do. So for instance, in pattern lab, I don't know of any ways to connect it to any of the design tools that I use like Figma or to connect it to any of the like um, uh, design sharing tools like Avocado or Zeppelin. Um, okay. Whereas with Storybook, I'm able to like, there's a robust network that's connecting these things. Like I can have a design in Figma connect either directly to Storybook, or I can have it connect directly to Zeppelin. And then Zeppelin connects directly to Figma and Storybook, allowing there to yeah. be like, uh, almost like a a shoot 
uh, from start to finish, allowing you to, to have this nice, strong connection, this nice, strong through line. So like, that's one of the, the big differences, I think, between Storybook and Pattern Lab. And I just want to call out too, you mentioned that the uh, user base is larger for Storybook. Just to, I think I mentioned this on the show previously, but um, I recently started a project and we were initially leaning towards Pattern Lab and pivoted to Storybook. And that was one of the selling points. Just to give our listeners an idea, Pattern Lab, Pattern Lab I think has an average of 10,000 downloads a month, whereas Storybook has an average of 10 million downloads a month. So it's two orders of magnitude. At, wait, no, that's more than two orders. Uh, three orders of magnitude larger um, user base. And I think there's one other really key difference that Pattern Lab has, and that is the add-ons. Like it's not just the ecosystem of like all the different tools that integrate, but the the native tools that it provides are much more geared toward what system you're using. So for example, Storybook, when you're building it, you're saying like, I am, I have a React site, so I want to build a React flavored Storybook. I have a Vue.js site, I have a native web component, I have HTML, like you're, you're defining that upfront and it kind of changes its flavor depending on that. And sorry, are we saying that that's not possible with Pattern Lab? Uh, it is, but Pattern Lab, in my experience, is a little bit more opinionated, especially mm -hmm. as it relates to Drupal. Um, so we'll get to this a little bit more later. You can integrate Storybook with Drupal, just like Pattern Lab, but I think this the Pattern Lab method is a lot more opinionated. Uh, you don't have as much flexibility. So with these changes, um, can you talk a little bit, you said it's been a few years since you've used Pattern Lab. Can you talk about why you made the switch? Like, why did you choose to use Storybook over Pattern Lab when you made that switch? Absolutely. So um, the, like, I think first and maybe second versions of Emulsify uh, used Pattern Lab. Uh, at the time, we actually had done like this large, robust test of like how we wanted to do it. And Pattern Lab was the, the clear winner. And we were very happy with it for a couple of versions of Emulsify. Uh, but then we started to look at like all of the things that we just talked about Storybook. Like it was more robust. It had more controls. Uh, it, it was more, ag more technology agnostic. You know, meaning that like we could build it in, you know, Twig, we could build it in HTML, we could use Mustache, we could use React, we could use Vue, we could really take any project and just kind of like slot it in and make use of it. Whereas with Pattern Lab, it was, as you said, a little bit more opinionated. So like we could do stuff in, in Twig or Mustache or HTML, and it was pretty easy. But at the time, there wasn't a good way to do anything like React or JavaScript with it. Uh, and we do work on headless projects. And so sometimes that's called for. And so that what really wasn't going to serve the needs of our clients, which is we want to make sure that when we provide them with an Emulsify instance of their component library, that they're able to take that component library and that they're able to easily use that where they need to use that. Um, we focus on building websites for the most part in the work that we do, but we also know that the work that we do expands beyond those horizons and has an impact beyond that. And we want to make sure that, that our clients have something that they can, can use going forward. Like, for instance, if we talk with a client and we're building a website for them, but they also have, you know, an uh, like an iOS app and an Android app, and maybe they've got a WordPress blog because they don't want to set up a blog in Drupal. We want to make sure that they're able to consume that um, with a minimal amount of effort. Uh, and so that's, again, part of the reason why we decided to move away from Pattern Lab to Storybook was because of how like platform agnostic it was. Hmm. So seeing, seeing great, uh, I'm seeing great similarities between Storybook and um, Drupal, right? Drupal having contrib modules, Storybook having add-ons. I'm wondering if uh, you could tell us um, what you think kind of the most useful add-ons for Storybook are. Oh, sure. Like there's, um, 
my goodness. Let's see. Uh, some of the ones I consider kind of like basic out of the box is the the documentations or the like adding a docs tab so that you can document what the different components like intentions are. So mm -hmm. what that means is, is that if, if you have a client who doesn't want to do a robust like design system, uh, but they do want to still catalog some of the, the reasoning behind some of the components and some of the logic, you can capture that with the documentation add-on. Um, I, I personally love controls, which is another add-on that allows you to like um, control the state or control what data goes into things. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you have a, a button or a call to action component and you want to see what it looks like with different text in it, you know, you can send the link to storybook to your client and tell the client, um, pardon you can tell the client that uh, just enter the text that you want in the button. You can see what it's going to look like, you know? Mm -hmm. So you can see if like their learn more looks good. If they're follow yep. this link, um, if they decide that they want to do something crazy, they can see what happens whenever it looks crazy. Um, no one likes a button that splits into two lines. Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, so that's another, another oh, good. Another right. nice thing about control is that one of my clients has done with it is they've also used it as a, um, design validation tool. So if mm -hmm. the client is trying to decide, you know, they're, they're designing the system, they're trying to decide between a couple of color themes, for example, they'll add an additional control so that they can change that color. Yeah. And then they can, when they're doing the review, they look at that component, it's just a drop down to change the color and say, hey, this is, if we go with option A, this is what we see. If we go with option B, this is what it will look like. And then you can make informed decisions. And then, you know, you would take that control away for the actual uh, finished product, but they've also used it as a way to to help build and validate the the content entry and design. Yeah, and um, you know, continuing along this this route, like whenever it comes to the clients, like they can they can review the site in different sizes with like a screen size add on, where you can either take like common screen sizes or specific screen sizes. If you've got a if you have a CEO who's still using a BlackBerry, um, you can like get that really small screen size uh, and try and convince them to maybe get a new phone. Uh, but they can at least see it on the the size that they want. Um, as part of that add-on. And then one thing I know that is very popular right now is accessibility. Um, and it should have been popular all along. Um, I call you accessibility user experience, um, but focusing on those users who don't get focused on nearly as much, you can actually run tests as part of Storybook so that you can see that like a, a color is going to get flagged like that that text color on the button is not going to work it it, it does not pass wcag double a or triple a whatever standards you want to and you can add in those like kind of tests um there's i mentioned it earlier a an add-on for adding in like links to figma um there are add-ons for zeppelin that that do that get added as well um and then it's actually, uh, I'm going to say it's not very hard to write your own add-on. Uh, I say that as someone who is a creative director and doesn't write his own add-ons. Um, but it seems that the documentation for creating that is fairly easy. And so that means that if you have a specific need and for some reason can't find it um, within this ecosystem, there's a lot of support for being able to write your own custom plugin. So that's that's great. Um, let me think. I, I just want to. I just oh, yeah. want to highlight the accessibility one too, um, because mm -hmm. for me that was the number one, a thousand percent thing that sold it for me for, uh, you know, for the future. Because I think we might have understated. You don't have to write your accessibility tests. Like if you want to, yeah. if you want to make them fine tuned, you can. But like, it's just an add-on that you enable, and then it runs the tests each time it builds. And it's fast. Um, so if you're um, checking colors, for example, you change a color in the CSS. Um, in the CSS, it will rebuild Storybook in half a second, a second, and then if it fails accessibility, you'll have a big red error saying this is failing accessibility. Here, here is a link to the rule that it's failing, and and then on on that um, link, you can usually find how to remedy it. Now, if it's a color that you just changed, obviously <laughs> you chose a bad color. 
Um, but if it's something a little more complex, you have that documentation. And for the client that I'm using Storybook heavily for so far, that really has been zero modification. Like I enabled that module and the accessibility test, you know, the, the quantitative accessibility testing is just available for every component immediately. Um, that to me sells it. Like it's, it's worth using just for that one, one feature. Um, so yeah, definitely check it out if you're on the fence. There's one more. I had to look it up while you were talking, Nick. Um, there's one more that I think is really awesome. And it is a an add-on by Chromatic for visual testing. Um, so that you can do uh so that you can find any like design regressions that happen. So if like you make a design change or if you make a design change to component A, but component B yep. throws up a flag on that change, then suddenly you notice that like, oh, I have some spillage between these components and I have to address that um, without having to actually go in and visually check over and over again. Yep. So that like visual regression testing is, um, uh, again, as creative director, one of my very favorite things because I can have confidence that like nothing's going to get messed up whenever changes happen over here. There's no unintended consequences. Definitely, um, definitely sounds like we all want to avoid design spillage. <laughs> I, I don't know about anybody else, but I have like alarm bells going off because we have not said the D word in a few minutes. <laughs> so we got to get back to Drupal. We have to meet up. Oh, Florida. oh, that's right. This is a clean podcast. I was completely in the wrong uh, realm. So yeah, oh. let's talk about Drupal. Integration with Drupal. Like, what does that look like? Sure. So um, we uh, we built Emulsify, which is kind of like a layer on top of uh, Storybook. We um, we have created various connectors that allow us to connect Storybook very easily, or the Storybook components very easily with Drupal. So um, what we do is all of the different components in Storybook, we the methodology and the naming that we use makes sense with the component library that we're building. So for instance, we're going to call a card a card. We're not going to, to call it like a summary, uh, which is, I think is like a Drupalism. Uh, basically, we're not going to use the Drupalisms uh, for naming conventions for things. We're going to name it based on what the people working on the project think that that should be called. And we have the um, like a Drupal twig file that points to the component that wants to be used. And we just like, that's it. We literally have just a little tiny twig file that connects it to Drupal and allows us to uh, create and maintain live within Drupal. So what this means is, is that when we make changes to the component, because the component is connected directly to the Drupal template, which is directly, which is what Drupal is using to render, um, we have instantaneous updates. Um, the storybook is never out of sync with the Drupal website. So like if we change that button from blue to purple and Drupal, we're going to see purple buttons. So does that mean that storybook is writing twig files? Is that what you're saying? Uh, little twig and CSS files or? Yeah. What I'm saying is, is that when you author the storybook, you're writing twig files. So yep. um, I mentioned earlier that there are various like flavors of storybook. Um, we have Emulsify set up. We're using Storybook HTML as a base, and then we've added in a helper for Twig so that we can use um, Twig files. That way there's we've got like a one-to-one -one with what Drupal is expecting and using. So um, so that that's that's how we've got that connected up. Yeah. So when you when you look at Storybook versus Pattern Lab, this part of it, the integration is pretty much exactly the same. You know, you're writing your components in Storybook, in Twig, CSS, and JavaScript files. And then you're including that library and referencing that Twig file in the Drupal template. So like you, you say you have a paragraph that's a card, you're writing, you're still writing that paragraph, you know, Twig template in Drupal, and you're including the Storybook one. Uh, at least that's the way I've seen it done. And then the, the difference is, on the interface for reviewing those components in a style guide format. You know, one of the reasons why you start using Pattern Lab is you can see all the components in one place. You can, you know, change the screen size. Uh, you can see what the template is, that kind of thing. And Storybook does that as well. It just has the additional features that we've we've been talking about. So the integration piece is pretty much the same in, in both as far as I've seen. Um, so there's, I mean, there's, 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 some, like there's some, 
there's a few differences. Like I think Storybook doesn't require gulp, for example, and Pattern Lab usually has some flavor of gulp that's like rendering things, but I mean, compiling things, but. Um, so there's no Drupal module that gets involved in this. No. no oh, you no need the Drupal requirements. Don't you need the components oh, module yeah. still? Yeah. You're right. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we need the components module. And that is so that um, Drupal understands, I believe it's so that Drupal understands the um, shorthand namespace. reference that we have namespaces uh, for referencing files. That way we don't have to do like this whole long, like relative link. We can just say at namespace and then folder file. So being the simpleton that I am, right? Where, 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 yeah, and it's okay, Mike, you and I can be, we, we can be on the same page on this one, but um, so I'm, I got it. We're building our twig in, uh, in storybook. That twig is being imported into twig templates in Drupal. Where is the variable replacement happening? Is that happening in Drupal? So like if we mm -hmm. need to inject content into that twig, right? Is that happening mm -hmm. in the, the Drupal template file or are we doing that in storybook and it's just happening like happening on yeah. the fly? Uh, so usually when we make modifications, if we can do it in twig, we do it in twig. So mm -hmm. modifying the, you know, using whatever, um, filters we need to in twig. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm trying to think, I believe that we keep like data modifications in the actual component itself and not in the Drupal component. Uh, I may be misstating, uh, okay. just because it's been a little while since I've, I've connected up Drupal um to pattern lab but it can exist either in the drupal template or sorry in the drupal twig file or within the storybook twig file whichever you want and of course we can also if we need to we can um use javascript to write variables into yep. any of those files that we need to so for instance in storybook we're not actually pulling any data from drupal um, right. So we have to mock that data using like a data JSON or YAML file. I think mm -hmm. usually we yeah. use YAML files for that. That way we can have some data to, to actually put in without having to like hard code anything. Right. So you, you can basically make a, you know, a, um, I don't know, a development rule, right? Like, Hey, we're going to mm -hmm. put all of our, all of our, variables into storybook and pass that along, or we're going to do the variable work in Drupal. That's kind of like yeah, a, it, a workflow thing, not a, not a technology. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. It's, yes. yeah. It's an implementation. It's an implement, implementation detail. And it, it also depends on what you're doing. Like in some cases, you know, usually you just pass whatever Drupal is outputting into the storybook component right. and, and you're handling that. But there's some cases where, for example, if you're combining two different paragraphs into one output, you might pre-process it and and pass that in. Or like menus, I almost always pre-process menus mm -hmm. in some fashion before I pass it in because Drupal just doesn't output nice menus when you're trying to build them into a component system. Uh, um, I did a headless site recently trying to get menus to work and it was a pain, so. So speaking of headless, perfect segue. Um, you mentioned that you do some headless sites. Uh, mm -hmm. Storybook yes. does. You can write native React or Vue.js components in Storybook. Um, do you? How do you integrate Storybook with Drupal in that case, or is it just a completely separate project and just a React? Well, so usually, um, when we are building with Storybook uh, in Emulsify, we're either doing a Drupal site or a decoupled or headless site. Um, there's usually not a lot of, we haven't had a lot of projects where it's called for both. So we haven't done them side by side. Um, but in the instance where we would want to do it side by side, um, you know, there's a couple of different methodologies that we could use. We could build a, like a, you know, component library for each of them, like a react one, uh, in storybook and a like twig slash HTML one. Like we could keep them separated, um, mm -hmm. you know, two different kind of like instances. We could also mix them together, um, you know, to actually have like a React flavor and an HTML flavor together. Um, I'm sure that that is a, a solution that someone on my team may have already done, but I don't recall any projects recently where we've done that. Uh, but you can have them exist side by side. 
Um, the most recent thing that I've talked about with the front end team is there's a JavaScript, JavaScript framework called Stencil JS that I discovered recently that allows you to, um, the purpose of it is to write web components, but also to create components for other kinds of libraries and systems like React or Vue. And so what, what I'm hoping that the team is going to do is investigate, you know, doing that and writing code in a way that like maybe stencil JS is our default because it will compile to a web component, which can be used in Drupal or a React component, which can be used in any of our uh, decoupled instances. Um, still early in that process. So I don't have any like anything definitive, but it's something that like I've discussed with the team that maybe we want to, uh, you know, uh, adopt that as, you know, write once, I, use everywhere. I, I would love to hear more about that because um, the project that I mentioned that's using Storybook heavily is it's native web components. And that was one of the benefits was that we're, you know, we use Storybook as a way to present the components to the customer and present documentation mm -hmm. for the components. But there's a separate build process that just builds native web components into their own, you know, because native web components is just a JavaScript file, right? with some yep. custom HTML, HTML element. Um, and so we build that separately and we can serve that file over a CDN. Um, so it's hyper efficient. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear kind of how, it, that would work perfectly as well in kind of this multi-service uh, multi use case where like it's headless as well as native Drupal or iOS, like it's just gonna work pretty much everywhere. Yeah, well, the um, interesting thing is that uh, Stencil JS is um, a, I don't know, uh, sub company, sub brand, sub project of uh, Ionic, which is a library okay. for like basically like writing HTML and getting uh, Android and iOS apps out of it. So I believe that uh, I would not be surprised if the intention, or maybe it does it now, like I said, I've just started exploring, um, would actually render out to iOS components or you know, something like that. So we, we've mentioned Emulsify a couple of times. Um, we've even gone as far as to kind of talk about what it is. Um, but I want to make sure that we're, we're highlighting that, you know, this is obviously a show about storybook, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Four Kitchens, is, you know, is the creator, is that fair to say, of Emulsify? Um, and uh, I want I want you to be able to tell tell our audience all about it. So here's here's the softball question. What is Emulsify? Well, I'm completely caught unawares by this question, but I will try and answer it as best I can. Um, no, so Emulsify really is the, like if you have a Venn diagram of Drupal and Storybook, Emulsify sits in the middle of that. Um, Emulsify is a, a free and open source tool for like for us to be able to build these um, component libraries and design systems. Um, and we wanna make sure that like teams have clear like users and uh, sorry, clear guidelines and like requirements for teams. We basically want to make sure that everybody has all the things that they need, like checking accessibility. Um, you know, sometimes clients will request, like they don't like gendered terminology. So we add an add on into storybook so that it like reviews all of the copy that gets put into it um, to like help, you know, with those sorts of things. So Emulsify is there for creating these design systems. Um, both as component libraries, like we've been talking about, but also a little getting a little bit larger and looking at it more holistically, like in terms of like, we want to have our philosophies for how the design system was made. We want to talk about like the, like maybe the documentation on the coding, like why we've made choices that we've made, um, marketing decisions that have been made uh, for certain components. All right. So I almost hate to ask this question because I feel like I'm a little bit, overwhelmed as it is um but where does emulsify fit in like can you use storybook with drupal without emulsify does emulsify just make the process easier like what's the relationship between the three if you can like kind of you know draw me a diagram in my head to help explain that all right well let me fire up fig jam and i'll make you a diagram 
So <laughs> here's uh, here's how it works. So you can use Storybook independently of Emulsify with Drupal. You can go in and do the things that you need to do. But some of the things that you need to do are going to be to create those uh, twig connector components um, that say like use this thing over here. Like I, this is the, was it the Drupal summary view display, um, and connect it up to the cards. Whereas with emulsify, we have a lot of that pre-written. So most especially menus. We talked earlier about how menus are complicated. We have like a component that will consume Drupal's menu stuff and do that. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, whenever it comes to JavaScript within Drupal, um, writing JavaScript in Storybook, you don't have access to the like the Drupalisms and firing um, the JavaScript off. And so mm -hmm. what Emulsify does is we have like this Drupal wrapper that we wrap around all the JavaScript for like the tabs and accordions and what have you, bells and whistles, so that whenever you're looking at it in Storybook or the code that you write in for Storybook is the code that you'll write for Drupal. Whereas if you just rolled your own with storybook, you would either have to recreate that or take that into account and then write like two different versions, depending on, on what you'd like to have with your workflow. Um, I'm also like, just makes it, Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, no, finish your thought. Then I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, I was just going to say, I'm also, it makes it really easy to work with Drupal um, in this way because of all of these affordances, like these problems that are easy to solve, but time consuming to solve. Like the menu problem, like, I mean, a smart person can get it done in a couple of days, but wouldn't you rather work on something else for a couple of days that's maybe more challenging? So, or, I or not. If you're watching the video, probably just saw the light bulb on over my head up here somewhere. So I'm going to use an analogy and just tell me if I'm right on this. Um, sure. It sounds like emulsify is to integration between Drupal and Storybook the same way is that like the core um, Drupal recommended project template makes it easier to use Composer with Drupal core, right? Because you can start a new composer project and include Drupal core recommended, but then you'd have to figure out the scaffolding stuff on your own mm -hmm. and you'd have to add composer installers on your own and you could do it, but it would take more time. So it sounds like the same thing's happening with storybook and Drupal and emulsify is just making the connections for you. And so allowing you to get to work on the stuff you want to be working on a little bit faster. That is very apt. Uh, and accurate. That is exactly the purpose of it is to give you a leg up in your work and to try to be not try to bring as few opinions as possible. So one of the things we've talked a lot about components, uh, what we haven't talked about is like, are those components like required? How do you adapt and use them? Um, we have emulsify set up so that you can actually um, either you can install all of the default components that we have, which kind of give you a, a leg up and getting things done. Um, you can install some of them or you can install none of them and do your own system. Like, for instance, we use the like uh, we use atomic design for like naming folders like we like atoms and molecules and, and all of that, mm -hmm. whereas like some other people, they might want like design tokens and just components um, and then have like subfolders within that um, either of those approaches or any approach that you would want to take is completely valid with emuls with emulsify so um so we don't have like you locked into a certain pattern or methodology so nick and john i'm pretty sure i'm not going to guess host anymore because i'm not sure anything i've said is or anything i could say is going to be more accurate than what i just said so i think i've hit my peak and i'm just gonna that's, that's drop fine the mic so, and run away so i mean i, is, I always feel it? like I always feel like uh, it's good good to have um, all perspectives, and yours yours is just just another another perspective. So I, I think we'll I think we'll have you back. I, I have a question, and you may have you may have alluded to this, you may have answered it, and I may have missed it. So I apologize if you already answered it. Emulsify sits between Storybook and Drupal. Is Emulsify a storybook add-on, a Drupal module, or just a separate standalone like thing that lives in between? Or, or is it a is it a Drupal theme? I mean, I think my question is: is it a Drupal module? Is it a yeah, Drupal I guess, theme? I guess it could be a theme too. 
Well, it is um, it is a combination of things. It uh, it includes Storybook as a dependency. So that means that Emulsify is kind of like a wrapper around Storybook. So it is not a Storybook add-on. It is It encompasses it and uses it. So it is Storybook Plus. Huh. Okay. Okay. So it's like so, a flavor of Storybook. But, well, it's no, because it's, <laughs> It's like building on top of it, all of these connections to Drupal, like Storybook, (laughs) Storybook doesn't care about Drupal. Storybook just cares about making components and presenting components. Um, And Emulsify cares about Drupal and it cares about WordPress and it cares about wherever these components are going to be used. So Storybook cares about the components. Emulsify cares about the system. We said this Um, is a clean podcast. WordPress. Yeah. Sorry. Mm, Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. You can bleep it. Um, Okay. So, and then, uh, the question of whether or not emulsify is a theme, it is also a theme. Like that's how it gets used in order for the, um, uh, the twig files that, that bring in the Drupal data, we create an emulsify theme and that's how we connect it up. Uh, and so emulsify is in fact a theme, but I don't, I don't like to lead with and start talking about it as if it were a theme, because I think that that does it an injustice on what it's supposed to be. Because with storybook, you can have a standalone storybook instance, like you can, you know, just have it off to its side where you've got the theme inside of your site, but then you also are generating this, this storybook, um, like Mm -hmm. for review for other people. And like, you can do a lot of different things with it. Um, so, so it is a theme, but I don't like frame it as such. Sorry. I'm laughing because on the video, you can see Mike's brain, like slowly leaking out of his ear. And, um, it's just, you know, his facial expressions are priceless. You know, I can, you send like it. Oh. I felt like I had a good handle on things. I did. I was feeling I had very high confidence. And then like 90 seconds ago, it just started just waning, down, waning away. So, I mean, I, I get it, right? So it's, it, you're, you're taking, you're, you're basically, it's a, like it's you a say, base theme. yeah, it's a, the glue between storybook and Drupal. It's basically wrapping mm-hmm. storybook, right? To say like, Hey, here's storybook. And then it's, it's providing the, the, the integration or the connection point to Drupal through a theme that you're using, all yeah. of which is highly customizable. I just really yes. want Randy to tell me it's a base thing and that's it. <laughs> but I feel like you don't want to say that. Well, I, I mean, uh, tell me what you mean by base theme, like something like Stark or like well, just uh, no, something more, where you would like... start your theme. Like, okay, I'll give you an example, yeah. like boot, Bootstrap Barrio. That's okay. or, a base or Omega theme. or Zen. Right. You know, it okay. has some Zen. tools that integrate with, you know, with a CSS framework. Um, so I'm imagining, and maybe it's wrong, that Emulsify is a base theme that has all of those links back to Storybook already pre-made for me. Yes and no. So yes, in that like it is good for building. Um, no, in that it is for building from scratch. Um, you know, we provide the framework. We we like you don't boot up with emulsify as a theme and have a site that looks like bootstrap or foundation or material or whatever, like emulsify thing that we have. Um, it shows up, it's more, um, uh, the only example I can think of is from the, the CMS that shall not be named, but, um, but basically just letting you like have all the connectors and, you know, the HTML written and allowing you to go in and define how those things get used. So, so you, let, me, let me help. Pull, let me, let me, let me help with, with Mike's question a little bit here. Uh, layer, layer on top of it, if you will, cause that's sure. a common theme right now. So <laughs> common workflow for folks using emulsify are they editing the emulsify theme or are they creating their own theme and pulling the emulsify theme in as a as a starting point the they are editing the emulsify theme okay so yes so what you could in theory one thing that you could do is you could take emulsify and create it and make it standalone so that you have front-end engineers and designers working on the components Mm -hmm. and they don't even have to be aware of drupal Uh, And then you can have the site builders in Drupal who say like, okay, I am including this theme as like a a Git submodule or like however you want to pull it from the Emulsify repo into your Drupal instance. And then you can you can do it that way. It is a theme 
but you can have it like separate to allow other teams to work on it. And if you did that approach, that then would allow you, because it would be separate and outside of your like Drupal repository, your Drupal Git repository, you would then be able to use it for like a React site for a, you know, other CMS site. Etc. So, so it's a so it truly is a starting point. You're not you're not mm-hmm. installing Emulsify with Composer and then updating it later on. You're just taking point in time, yes. grabbing that code base, making your own theme from it, mm-hmm. and then if there's any features that you need to add, they get added later. You have to manually do that. You're you're not. It's not a base theme. It's not a theme. It's basically, hey, here's a point in time integration between Drupal and Storybook. Take it, start there. But it's a custom theme yourself that you're, yes. you're starting when you start the project. Yes, and I'm sorry that if I haven't sense. given that, okay. I'm, I'm sorry no, if no, I've, that, that, I've no, had that, a hard time unique. communicating that. Okay. No, no, that, that's kind of unique. There's not really a space in Drupal terminology for that, but but it also really, I've only seen it really happen with Pattern Lab and with Storybook because they're tightly coupled to the theme that they're used in. They're, it's not a base theme. Because if you did a base theme off of it, anything in the sub theme, wouldn't show up in storybook yeah. would kind of defeat the purpose. Um, but like you said, there's a lot of steps you have to do to make storybook work with, with Drupal. So if you have a starting point, that's perfect. So that okay. makes sense now. So yeah. now that, now that we've ironed that out, we've kind of like got it, got it all on the table here. I'm going to ask a really difficult question. Um, do you see any cases where someone, you know, might not want to use storybook or emulsify for that matter? I think, so the question comes down to, do you think that you should be using a component driven methodology for the work that you're doing? Like that's, that's really the first question that comes before that, which is if you're using a component driven methodology for design and development to create a component library, then you should have a way to view and edit and update that component library. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically if you're going to use a component library, you should use emulsify, uh, Mm -hmm. it, now the question is like, when would you want to eschew and not do a component driven library? Well, that would be for simple sites. That would be for sites that are really small, really easy, really basic sure. sites that um, maybe you're using a framework and just modifying it. So like if you're just pulling like material or bootstrap and you've got like custom like configuration for them and really just recompiling it based on what they have by default, like there's no unless you need to review it, there's no reason to build out those components because you're getting those components from those libraries and the ways that they've presented them, usually an NPM package. Mm -hmm. Um, And so those are some instances where you would want to not do it. But for the most part, um, Drupal sites are enterprise. They're big, they're robust. There's a lot of different features. Um, And so you would want to use a like component driven methodology for for those projects to be able to to upkeep and maintain them so like so there are very few instances i think where you would want to not do that so basically your your response to sum it into like a really really short sentence is like use common sense right if it's a simple if it's a simple site you don't need to over over complicate it right Absolutely. You know, um, yeah, if it's a simple site, don't overcomplicate it. A lot of people, um, you know, I've had this discussion a, a bunch of times with like designers and front end engineers, you know, where we create like a system or a process for doing things or a naming convention. And suddenly you run afoul of like it's becoming overly burdensome, becoming a problem. Um, and that's when I just kind of advise them. I'm like, well, scrap it. You know, if the process, if the process is a problem or like if the process is making it hard to get your work done, the process is the problem. Get rid of it, revise it, something like that. Like why work harder if there's no justification for that? So yes, use common sense. Um, you know, if you need to change something to um, get things done faster and just as reliably, then do that. So have you seen any really interesting uses of Storybook either within Drupal or without Drupal in the mix? Uh, Storybook, honestly, like there are a lot of 
uh, a lot of people are using Storybook. In fact, the uh, Storybook community uh, recently came out with like a design system library. Um, I'm not sure if that's the word that they're using. I think showcase. Yes, I'm looking at it right now um, where they're sharing popular storybooks where you can actually see what people have done and and how they've built that. So, you know, the one of the one of the core things that draws me to Drupal is its open source, like philosophy and community and storybook really kind of like brings that along with it. Uh, and, and being able to look at what other people have built using storybook is awesome. Like you can go and check out what like the guardians instance is Adobe's um, spectrum for their design, GitHub's primer, um, you can go and see exactly what they've built and how they've built it in a very public way, which means that like the learning that you can get um, not only from them sharing and giving talks and blogging about it, but also looking at the artifact itself and saying like, OK, why did they make that choice um, or why did they not make this other choice um, and draw inspiration from what other people have working uh, have done instead of trying to like. You know, uh, it's just another way of learning, which is great. Like I know myself, I'm a big fan of, of writing things in React and working in Gatsby. But one thing that I don't like about a lot of like JavaScript based like sites that I see is an obfuscation of the way that the site is built. Like whenever CSS variables are like H dash numbers, you know, um, it's like, you know, no one... <laughs> Like, I understand that a lot of social media companies do this so that they can't, um, people can't do add-ons to like prevent Facebook from getting their ad revenue, but it makes it really hard for an open web to learn and grow. And that's one of the things that's most important to me. So, um, so yeah, kind of, kind of went off the deep end a little bit there, but, um, <laughs> but I really think that, um, storybook has that open source mentality that really kind of helps everyone. And, and as a programming as a programming note here, before you continue, Mike, yeah, Tailwind, we did a show uh, last week or the week before on Tailwind, super readable CSS. So if you want to, you want to go down I that am, road, I am deep in that rabbit hole. Yeah. See, I, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole with you, Randy, but I, I, I figured that you, you might be. Yes. I like it a lot. So what's the relationship between chromatic and Storybook. I know Storybook is open source. It seems like Chromatic is a for-profit company. And I could be wrong. I'm, I'm just kind of going by the 10 minutes of research I did. Um, so I'm just curious, is, is that the type of relationship kind of like WordPress, I'm sorry, the W word and automatic, where the, the vast majority of the contributors are from you know, uh, Chromatic and like, what's the, what's the business model there? Like, how does, you know, Storybook appears to, you know, have all kinds of momentum and great features and, mm -hmm. you know, is this, is this the work of just an amazing volunteer community or, or what's that look like? You know, I think it's one of those, like, there's a spectrum there, you know, uh, Storybook is, is very popular because it's very robust with good documentation and the easy ability to write add-ons and a bunch and of useful add-ons. And, that and stuff then, a lot of and, time. <laughs> well, well, it does. And then you have companies that are like, everyone's using Storybook. I need to, like, we need to have a Storybook add-on, you know? And so they, companies like Chromatic and Zeppelin and et cetera, they, they write plugins to allow you to connect to their services. Um, with the expectation that it makes it easier to use their services and easier to use the tools that you have. So it really benefits everybody. But there is like, you know, with with Chromatic for the for the visual testing, for the automated visual testing, like you have to pay Chromatic whatever their paid tier is once you reach a certain point. So like yes, there are sure. add ons that allow you to use services that aren't free. Um, but the fact that it exists makes it easier to do the work that you have to do as opposed to like writing an add on or doing that work yourself. So and, and I want to, I want to clarify too, like uh, the, okay. the chromatic, the chromatic visual regression testing, like, yes, it's a paid feature, but I think it's one of those, it, it's fairly, it's fairly transparent, like the accessibility. If you're paying for it and you install that add on, you'll get visual regression tests. You'll get, automatic builds of your your storybook site um i actually looked at 
because Backstop is a visual regression, regression library. I looked at just integrating Backstop into Storybook and let's just say it's complicated to do yourself. So it's one of those things where yes, you have to pay for it, but it's probably well worth your while. So, uh, so and that's, hearing that's paying for the theme. service. The service. Well, yes. well, yeah, the, the add-ons, unlike um, the CMS that shall not be named, add-ons for Storybook are free. Okay, so you don't have to pay for add-ons. It's not like, you know, um, other ecosystems where you have to pay a couple hundred dollars to get access to what yeah. is technically a GPL licensed uh, plugin uh, or add-on. So you can install them for free, but if they tie back to another service, the company that makes that service may want to charge you to be able to use that. So mm -hmm. another point of clarification here, because um, I kind of went deep down this rabbit hole as we were, as you guys were talking, you are not referring to the Drupal agency named Chromatic. You are referring mm -hmm. to another Chromatic, yes. correct? I believe so. I believe it. I believe they're different. Companies. No, I, I, yes, they okay. are different. They are different companies. I mean, I was just trying to um, elaborate on the chromatic that you are talking about and what specifically they do. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, John. I, I knew what Mike was talking about, but uh, now that you mentioned that chromatic is a Drupal agency, I was like, yes, they actually are. Darn. Yeah. Different. Two companies, two different companies, same name. So that's, could be confusing. So we are coming uh, into uh, the end of the show here. Uh, we are bringing it in for a landing, as I like to say. One final question, Randy. We have talked a lot about Storybook um, and uh, Emulsify and wondering what the best way to get started with Storybook and Emulsify are and um, if you have any go-to resources for beginners. Absolutely. So the um, so with Storybook, and I don't say this often about projects, but I would actually say go to the documentation on the site. Um, yeah. You know, it's it, the documentation in Storybook. They have. Um, uh, I think they have like fast and slow documentation. Like if you've got a handle on what you're doing, like you can get like the fast tutorial. Um, whereas if you have, um, you know, no idea what you're doing, they've got the, the hand holding version sort of like Gatsby has that fast and slow as well. Um, as for using Emulsify, um, honestly, Emulsify's documentation, um, it's pretty usable outside out of the box, um, but it's going to rely a lot on that storybook documentation because a lot of the like interactions, um, if you want to do anything fancy with it, refer to storybook. Um, but Emulsify does have documentation at uh, emulsify.info is the website and you can find our docs and uh, uh, install it either freestanding or as a theme in Drupal. So it sounds like you would recommend people learn a little bit of storybook first before even looking at Emulsify? Well, honestly, like take Emulsify, go to emulsify.info, um, do an install of Emulsify, like run the, like we have a, a um, CLI interface for Emulsify that makes it really easy. Go through that to install it. Um, run like NPM storybook or yarn storybook to like get the storybook up and running um, and then experiment with the things that you can do. Um, and then as you have questions about the storybook interface, you will have to refer to the storybook documentation. So, so I have two quick comments about that. Um, I agree sure. the documentation at storybook, the uh, storybook documentation is great. Um, it is specific specialized for the system you're building in. So one tip is when you're, when you go there, um, it defaults, I think, to React, but there's like a little drop down mm -hmm. on the left and you can say, I'm looking for Vue.js or Twig or HTML or whatever. So you wanna make sure you're looking at the correct documentation. And somewhat ironically, the only documentation that has confused me on there is their documentation about the documentation add-on. Um, <laughs> just doesn't quite work the way that their documentation says. Um, I've run into a couple of issues there, but everything else has been spot on. You know, I ran into that same issue recently. I was trying to figure out how to do um, like data only stories with MDX and like- Yeah, just, no, that's it was, exactly- 
Yeah, no, it's just know, it wasn't doing what it wanted to do. That was exactly what I ran into. So what I ended up doing is just embedding um, dot md so markdown files directly and replacing the doc description um, var variable in the story to use just my readme and then um, this is really deep but anybody who's using storybook this will be helpful for and then you can add style tags to i believe it's preview.html preview-head.js Correct. You got it. Yeah, or HTML. And, and that and then you can add some styles there to override anything else that you need to on those pages. But yes, that is the exact issue I ran into <laughs> was getting MDX to work. Um but anyway, now that we're out of that rabbit hole, thank you uh for joining us, Randy. Uh this has been really enlightening for Storybook and uh Emulsify. Uh so we appreciate you taking the time. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on the show and thank you for the invite. And I'm glad that I got to talk about this. Do you have questions or feedback? Reach out to Talking Drupal on Twitter with the handle Talking Drupal or via email at show at talkingdrupal.com. You can connect with our hosts and other listeners on Drupal Slack in the Talking Drupal channel. If you're interested in show news, upcoming Drupal camps, local meetups, Chad's book corner, or Abby's biweekly game review, sign up for our newsletter at talkingdrupal.com slash newsletter and you can promote your drupal community event on talking drupal learn more at talking drupal.com slash camp promo thank you patrons for supporting talking drupal your support's greatly appreciated we can uh, you can learn more about becoming a patron at talking drupal.com and choosing that button in the uh, sidebar become a patron and randy if our listeners wanted to get in touch with you what's the best way to do that uh, it would be either be on Twitter where my handle is at amazing rando, uh, or via email at Randy at four kitchens.com. And Mike, if our listeners wanted to get in touch with you, uh, you can find me online. Uh, username is Ultimike, Twitter, Drupal.org, all the other normal places, uh, as well as DrupalEasy.com and as well as at Drupal Easy on Twitter and LinkedIn, and everywhere else. <laughs> How about you, John? I'm John Picozzi on all the major social networks and Drupal.org. And you can find out about EPAM at EPAM, e com. And you can find out about me at Nixvan, N-I-C-X-V-A-N, pretty much everywhere. And if you've enjoyed listening, we've enjoyed talking. Thanks, everyone. See you guys next week. Bye.